much. Thank you for this for this um, introduction and thank you um, everyone for being here today. So yes, indeed, I'm going to uh, show a few examples of Latin, not particularly Neo-Latin, but included uh, Neo-Latin included of um, how stylometry might be applied to a uh, real case scenarios. Let me start the screen share. I hope you can see the, um, the slides. So, yes, uh, I, my, see. I see okay. it, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so my, my talk will be about uh, tracing textual similarities, which um, I will restrict myself to stylometry because textual similar similarities might be might be seen differently depending if you trace the topic similarities or uh, stylistic similarities or some similarities be between ideas or uh, intertextuality as you know patterns of text reappearing from one text to another. So. Um, why the quantitative um, methods in literary studies should be applied. So um, there are at least uh, three reasons. One, one being that uh, they can uncover the patterns that are not very much visible to a naked eye. So they can focus on tiny, tiny differences that are neglectable for, for a human. That one, that, that's one thing. The second thing is the scale. So you can scale up your study uh, to seeing at the at the same time hundreds of texts, for example, at, at, at the same time, which is which is a big advantage of what is called today distant reading or a non-reading or you know reading without reading, but just by analyzing um, large amounts of texts. And thirdly, this is a kind of modeling, so it reduces the phenomenon into just measurable um, parts of it. One percent of the style can be measured by. Uh, by means of uh, stylometric methods. So we are, of course, we have to be aware of the fact that we are reducing um, the, uh, the phenomenon into just a bunch of measurable uh, features. And stylometry is aimed at measuring, um, well, written style mostly, well, mostly if not exclusively written style in order to find tiny, tiny differences in um, or between word frequencies. So word frequency being the feature that we are um, going to focus on today. And um, the thing is that uh, those frequencies, word frequencies, you might think, and this is the right thinking, thinking of course, are embedded in the context, right? So the context makes up a text, which is true, of course. But in stylometry, the assumption is that if you disregard the order of the words, if you just take the uh, pure frequencies, this should be, in, and in, in most cases, it is um, enough to see, for example, authorial signal of an anonymous author if you want to do authorship attribution because authorship attribution is one of the uh, most um, the most common applications of stylometry. So how it works if you take a, a text, be it a text in Latin of an author I will be referring to in a couple of minutes. Um, so you just slice this text into particular words and you um, count those words and take the, the measurements, take the frequencies. Right, so it results in a vector, as we call it, or a row, a column of um, well frequencies or our or measurements. Right, so how frequent a, a given word is, and then you do the same thing for different texts, and you compare those vectors of words, and you compare those rows of frequencies as um, as uh, shown in this picture. Right, so you take the same uh, number of features be it very frequent words or some other features, and you compare it uh, across your corpus, right? In order to find some similarities and dissimilarities. And this is the final, one of the possible, of course, uh, final outcomes of such a, such a, uh, such a procedure. This is um, in the New Testament, Greek New Testament, and uh, some texts tend to group because they are similar, because they are similar um, given their frequencies. So as you can see here, uh, the uh, gospels, and the acts are grouping together, are clustering together, which is not the case of the apocalypse or revelation, right? And which is not the case of St. John's apocalypse, right? And here are the, 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 episode, the epistles to uh, Romans, to the Corinthians and so on and so on and so on, right? So um, the aim here is to identify those groups of texts. And now, as I said, in most cases, uh, stylometry is being um, applied to authorship attribution and um, as promised, this presentation will be focusing on Latin examples, not necessarily Neo-Latin, but uh, here's a medieval case 
of Gallus Anonymous, um, Pol uh, Chronica Polonorum, the first example of Polish literature, even if not in Polish, but in Latin, but still the first that we have, the, the, the text with which the Polish literature starts, basically speaking. Uh, the only problem being here that the author is anonymous. And it has been hypothesized uh, back in the 16th century that uh, he must have been um, from Gaul, from France, from, from Ireland, perhaps, uh, a Gaul, broadly speaking. So therefore, Gallus Anonymous is the name used in, in, in history, has been um, used for history for many centuries. And back in the 19th century, there, 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 there was another hypothesis that the guy must have been from Hungary. And um, only recently in mid 20th century, a new discovery has been made that there is a very, very uh, strong textual similarity between uh, this Chronica Polonorum and uh, Translatio Nicolai, Sancti Nicolai by um, the monk of Lido from Venice. So uh, therefore the Venetian um, hypothesis of the authorship was proposed. And um, so um, I approached this problem um, with silometric methodology. And this is the very, very first um, glance at the, uh, at the two texts. You know, there is no comparison to other texts, but um, you can see that there is uh, a distinct cluster for a Translatio Nicolai by Monachus uh, Litorensis, or the monk of Lido, and um, the Gallus Anonymous's um, chronica is being split. But you know what's totally interesting here is that the split goes, um, goes uh, down the uh, particular parts of the book. Right, or, or particular part, parts of the chronicle. So this is the book one, the three first, um, the three first samples. Uh, then it goes chronologically to the sample four, five, six, and seven, which is which is the um, book um, two and the beginning of the book three. And uh, it goes all all the way down to the book uh, to the book three and the eighth um, and the eighth um, sample, which is um, suggesting very, very strongly that there is also a, this temporal signal. So the chronicle evolves uh, stylistically, right? But this is this is not this is a side effect. This is a side um, side outcome. Uh, and let's come to the to the um, to the main one, which is the question: So who is the authorship of uh, of that chronicle, or is it? Is uh, Gallus anonym, Anonymous ident uh, the identical with the monk of Lido? And here is a bunch of like 13 texts um, uh, of um, the, the contemporaries. And as you can see, Monachus and, and, and Gaul uh, with his chronic Apollonorum are being kept together. And no matter what kind of parameters I use, th these are also uh, always uh, kept together. But one might, might ask, so, well, but this uh, comparison set, this, this control group is very, very small. What if we go big? What if we take into this equation, say 150, 160 Latin texts coming from, you know, varying from Caesar, that's Caesar over here on this, in this network, that's Varro, that's Vitruvius, that's Seneca, that's Cicero, you know, all the guys that, 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 are, that are there, if you put them into the picture. So what will be the outcome of that? And um, the Gallus is somewhere here. If we zoom in or if we simply, you know, uh, black out all the other guys, you will see Gallus Anonymous being linked to some other authors. Let me zoom in. As you can see, Gallus Anonymous very, very strongly connected to, um, to the Monk of Lido, so when I was Litorensis. And this connection is way stronger than the interconnection between the works of uh, Cicero, the interconnection be between the works of Caesar, and so on, so on, so on. So this gives us a very strong argument that, um, that these two guys are quite, quite, quite identical stylistically. So this, this is probably the same, the same person. There are, of course, more advanced ways of assessing authorship by this machine learning, of, uh, fancy machine learning methodology, but I will not focus on them uh, today. Uh, just for your reference, I also use those fancy methods and, and the outcome is basically the same. So um, no matter how interesting uh, authorship attribution might be, uh, what I find um, really attractive and catching in stylometry is that it can be uh, extended and can be generalized to assess more general questions. 
And uh, one of those questions may, might be textual similarities between the original texts and their uh, late followers, for example. If we've got uh, Vegio following Virgil in his um, Supplementum and Eidos, right? The question is, of course, the topical differences will be there, but will there also be the uh, stylistic differences <laughs> visible? <laughs> So here I present a um, network of like 60 um, poetical works or epic poetry mostly for most of the part um, of different uh, authors from the ancient time and the um, early modern, uh, including uh, the, uh, the Middle Ages. Okay. And as you can see here, we've got the, um, the three books of uh, the Metamorphoses, um, Metamorphosis on uh, Liber by Ovid. And uh, here is uh, Galandus uh, with his Supplementum Ovidianum. There is some connection, but it is very, very thin, right? So it seems that, uh, or it is, it, is, it is suggesting, this network is suggesting that even if the connection exists, uh, Galandus is not doing very well when it comes to, to the style of, um, of his um, source of inspiration, which is not the case of um, Lucanus with his Pharsalia, very strongly connected um, with himself, which is what would be expected. So the author signal is there, but they, 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 here you've got uh, May Supplementum Pharsalia, the two parts, and as you can see, the connection is stronger, right? There is, there is, there is definitely some relationship on, on a stylistical, uh, on a stylistical level, of course. And here is the third example, which is Virgil in blue, and his uh, late follower uh, Vegus Supplementum and Eidos. As you can see, quite nicely connected with Virgil, but also collect, connected to uh, Silius Italicus. And uh, well, Sanazaro is the part of Virginis, or also very nicely connected to uh, Virgil's Aeneid, even if we remember that Sanazaro was actually following the, uh, the eclogues of Virgil rather than the Aeneid. But still, this, this um, uh, stylistic signal seems to be there. Okay, let's move on to um, some other applications of um, this um, stylometry being generalized uh, beyond author's attribution. If we use, or if we um, assume that um, a given text doesn't necessarily mean one um, monadic entity, and if we can uh, think of slicing a text into segments and assessing them sequentially, then we might a question, for example, of a translatorial signal. So here's the famous um, example of the Vulgate by uh, Saint Jerome, who translated it back in the fourth century. And as um, most of you um, know very well, even if it is not actually proven, but there is, there is a strong suggestion that Saint Jerome mostly translated the Old, the, the Old Testament because there was none. Um, apart from the Psalms, Apart from some other uh, tiny pieces, there were no translations of the Old Testament. But as um, for the New Testament, the already existing translations were there. They were known as uh, Vetus Latina. And um, St. Jerome uh, was claimed to mostly adapt, polish, elaborate, you know, stylistically work on um, the New Testament and translating the Old Testament basically from scratch. So the question is, Will the translatorial signal uh, be visible when we slice this text into pieces and then assess them um, sequentially one after another? And a very good um, the methodological question being here, well, yes, but we have no um, other text to compare um, to compare St. Jerome to, right? We, of course, have lots of texts, uh, lots, lots of texts of homilies uh, written by St. Jerome, but this wouldn't be a very good point of reference. So a dirty trick has been applied here in this picture. You can see the outcomes. So what I did, I have taken the book of Genesis, that's the first one, as a you know, fingerprint, as a point of reference, as, a, um, as uh, the training material for the model to pick up the, uh, the idea of the Old Testament. And I've taken the Acts over here as an ideal example of the New Testament, so that the model picks up two different two different stylistic uh, stylistic uh, traces, one for the uh, 
for the new uh, for the Old Testament being represented by the Genesis, and one for the New Testament being represented by um, by the Acts. And as you can see, the division is indeed here, right? So um, as if um, this um, this transition from one testament to the other was um, was picked up very very precisely, except that it's not. Of course, the division is here. So um, the model indeed detects the transition. Actually, it's not just a transition. It's it's a very very sharp sharp cut um, takeover from this uh, new Old Testament style to the uh, New Testament style. Except that it's not true. As you can see. Here's the division that we know between the Testaments. Uh, here's the division between the Old and the New Testament and the takeover point goes a few uh, books uh, um, earlier, right? So it is not, as it turns out, this is not the division between the New and the Old Testament, but instead, as you remember the Maccabees, because this is the, the, the two final books of the um, Old Testament, the Maccabees were written not in Hebrew, they were written in Greek, right? So rather than having detected the um, change of style between the Old and the New Testament, we have just um, identified the trace or the swap, the, 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 the takeover between the original Greek and the original Hebrew language that were translated by Saint Jerome to Latin. So still those, those traces of the original language um, are visible in this final version of the Vulgate, but also some other interesting, um, interesting um, exceptions should be, should be pointed to, which is, um, that's the wisdom, the, the book of wisdom, is also sort of picking up this, this New Testamental style or this originally um, a Greek language style, which is quite strange, as if those translations existed before, right? Something like that. I, of course, have no um, a comparison material, so we can only hypothesize. But again, as you can see, the, this um, style is, is a little bit blurry, uh, roughly, um, roughly at the wisdom, roughly at the Psalms, this kind of uh, prophet, um, uh, prophet um, uh, books in here. And finally, the fourth example. So we, we have seen the, um, an example of an author's attribution, an example of um, um, tracing the followers, something on uh, tracing translatorial signal. And now a very, very simple question. Is there any difference between poetry and prose in Latin? Of course it is, you might, or you might say. And uh, that's right, for a human being, it is very, very simple to, um, to tell apart um, poetry and, and prose. Um, so intuitively, not a, big, not a big deal, right? To tell uh, apart one text of another. But the question is, if we, if we disregard the uh, versification, if, if we disregard the uh, you know, rhyming uh, schemes and so on and so on, does the language itself differ? Does, does the style itself differ? That would be the question. And I still claim that yes, that's you know, an example of poetry, an example of prose without um, the, the division into lines. And it's still very, very simple for a human to, to pick this up uh, or to, 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 to distinguish um, poetry and prose. The question being, will that be equally um, easy for, uh, for, um, for machine learning technology to, uh, to find this distinction? And I've, uh, I've taken a very similar um, corpus to the previous, previously discussed, which is 205 texts uh, in which 150 were prose, 55 poetic texts, um, again, ancient, medieval, early Christian, early modern, uh, all that I could uh, find, um, given that uh, the spelling was consistent because that was that was a very important factor here. And it included all the genres and quite the, quite the number of, um, of words. And as you can see here in this picture, I again use this bootstrap consensus network approach, not the best one in the market, perhaps when it comes to reliability, but definitely one of the best when it comes to uh, clear outcomes that are, um, that are depicted on the, in the final picture. 
So as you can see, we've got a clear cut division into, not clear cut, but relatively clear cut uh, division into two, um, into two regions. One is uh, poetry and the other is prose. I, I, I added the colors afterwards so that we can see how big this distinction is. So no problem at all for a machine to distinguish between prose and poetry, it seems, right? But it becomes more and more interesting when we zoom in and a look at those interesting exceptions on both sides, because um, rather than being totally disconnected, those two clusters for poetry and prose have something in common. So the good question is, who is at the edge? Who is, who is sending the link uh, from, po from prose to poetry? And who is that guy here, right? Um, so prose, but resembling poetry rather than typical prose. So who does not fit here? And this is uh, this is the zoom, uh, zoomed in um, uh, approach. And here are the labels. So as you can see, and that you know, for me um, personally, that's that's an important part um, as a philologist, not only a stylometrist but also a philologist who does not fit fit to this picture. And as you can see, the most uh, poetic prose writer is Apuleius with his three parts of Metamorphosis on Liber. So. Uh, yeah, I, I love to read this book, um, but I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't expect it to be so poetic in terms of style, right? Um, again, on the other side, there is Ambrosius Epistolae, which is linked very, very strongly to to to, to poetry, but also Piccolomini Epistolae by Piccolomini, Petrarch, Contramedicum, Cassio, Cassiodorus, this kind of this kind of um, authors seem to be very, very uh, similar to, to poetry. And in the middle, we've got Comedianus and uh, Planctus Naturae by Alanus. As you remember, it is a composition of prose and poetry, so no wonder it is here, right? It is, it is right, uh, right in the middle. So I also created a second um, sample containing you know, just the poetry by Alanus, and it rightly uh, positions itself on the poetry side. So we are not uh, surprised at all by Alanus being here, but Apuleius is definitely a surprising, a surprising um, author in in um, in someone else's cluster. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's the zoomed in um, uh, sort of poetical um, prose writers: Piccolomini, Petrarch, Ambrosius, Cassiodorus, and that's the other uh, that's the other um, cluster. So. Now the question I would be per personally very interesting, uh, very interested in would be the following one. We can see the distinction quite clearly, but what is responsible for that, for that distinction? What makes poetry poetry, right? What is, what is the words that are the, the, the decisive factors here? Of course, we expect the words to be uh, very, very frequent uh, function words rather than um, something well, important or um, containing some 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 um, some actual information, poetic versus prose information. But let's see. So, in order to approach this 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 this, um, this question of which words are decisive here, which words are are, are making poetry poetry, I uh, I um, approached it um, by this fancy modern supervised classification methodology, um, which is also you know, referred to as machine learning or uh, artificial intelligence. This is, this is the methodology that tries to learn um, one class or the other and tries to generalize. And then uh, when uh, facing new data, it tries to link it to either the, 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 the first or the second um, the category already existing uh, in, a, in, a, in a form of a model. So the question being which words um, will, will show up and when I use uh, nearest rank and centroids, um, here are the words. The, um, the red ones are for poetry, the uh, blue ones are for prose. Oh, yeah, we can, we can, we can um, guess that this is poetry, but the rest of the words are actually quite interesting. Let me show it um, in, a, in a, let me show a, a, a broader picture here. So for poetry, we've got au, nunc, dum, nec, tibi, pectore, tua, sub, fata, and so on and so on. And for prose, 
ad in eus etiam ex vero el quam cum, and so on and so on. So there is no, it doesn't make any sense, does it, right? But if we start um, inspecting the, this list, one category after another, what we discover is, for example, uh, nil versus nihil. So poetry tries to, when it comes to synonyms, um, the poetry goes for nil and uh, prose goes for nihil, for the, for the full version, and poetry for the contracted one. Um, Sick is the, um, the choice for poetry. Eta is the choice for, for prose. So these are, these are not synonyms, but you know, near synonyms, right? And if you inspect them further, there is like the first and the second person in poetry, tibi, tua, tu, mea, mihi, te, as opposed to the third person in prose. Eius, se, it, quidem, suam, qui, eos, ea, and so on and so on and so on, right? So we, we start discovering interesting patterns here, but these patterns can also be explained without you know, any fancy technologies. We know that poetry is mostly about myself and, and you, right? The second person, and, and say um, historical process about um, mostly, if not exclusively, uh, about the third person. So let's, let's also um, try to um, read this list once more. And that's, that's the big discovery. That, that, that was really striking. That was really surprising to me um, when I discovered that. I mean, the um, prepositions, the lack of prepositions in poetry and um, well, over uh, under representation of prepositions in poetry, they are still there. They are still present, represented by to a um, significantly lesser, de lesser degree, which is not uh, the case of prose. In prose, um, the, the prepositions are uh, are where they should be. And well, having 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 discovered that, I've I, I've put only those nine most uh, important, most frequent prepositions at in ex cum a inter de caput contra, and did an analysis as if rest the rest of the words didn't exist. So I just based my analysis on exclusively nine uh, features, nine prepositions, to see what what an outcome can be. And here is here is the outcome. I marked uh, poetry uh, in red and uh, prose in green this time for an unknown reason. But as you can see, there is a very clear cut distinction, right? So it turns out that those nine prepositions is enough to tell prose and poetry apart, which is, which is quite cool, with some exceptions. Those exceptions, um, again, in, once more include Achilles on the one side as a very poetic a prose writer and a bunch of texts which are very not very much um, fitting to the to this pattern of poetry, which is Petrus de Bolo, Walter Maps, Archipoeta, and, and Commodianus. Those those five texts do not fit. But apart from those, um, you know, six um, exceptions, the uh, remaining two hundred texts are fitting very very nicely to this to this model. So it's already time to conclude, I guess. Uh, so as you can see, there, there, there used to be a strong, there, there's, there is a strong distinction between prose and poetry visible by means of both a human eye and also machine learning approaches. Uh, but what is interesting here uh, is that if you exclude all the content words and uh, focus exclusively on nine bare function words, on nine prepositions, you still see a huge distinction into to, uh, those those two, those two groups, right? Well, is it a recipe for poetry that just throw out your your prepositions? I'm not sure, but you know that that would be a provisional that uh, that would be a provisional out, um, outcome. So um, that's it. Those four um, those four tiny case studies. When the study on Gallus Anonymous is, is, is published, I had the belief I, I will ever have enough time to publish the rest of those things, but I, I will be very happy to, uh, to get some feedback and to, to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.